A couple of weeks ago, I was watching a clip on YouTube of Stephen Colbert and Jim Gaffigan in a dialogue. Stephen Colbert is a very well-known uh, stand-up comedian, also late-night talk show host, commentator. They were talking about family, relationships, fatherhood. Stephen Colbert made this statement. A father's job is to be distant, authoritative, and never quite pleased. That way the children can eventually understand God. A father's job is to be distant, authoritative, and never quite pleased. That way the children can eventually understand God. He claims to be Catholic. He is practically an atheist. He even said so. But there is remarkable truth in this statement. That fathers, we carry a very hefty burden that actually the way we live prepares our children for how they will see God. A loving, open father that invites and cherishes, prepares them to see a father in heaven who is also affectionate and loving, but a father who is distant, uninterested, and always mildly displeased, maybe even in the worst case, abusive, actually mars the picture of that person as they begin to see and understand who God is. What I find is that in our world today, the prevailing notion of God is just that, distant, authoritative, all these rules and always mildly displeased. And even in the Christian church, how many Christians see God as totally uninterested in their life, constantly keeping tally about how they are a constant failure and never being quite good enough. This image of God, however, is completely inconsistent with what we've been studying in John 17. Because if you think about John 17 and how it pictures God, well, first of all, in the previous chapters, Jesus walking with his disciples and acutely aware of their insecurities, their doubts, their fears, and him lovingly coming up alongside them and saying, don't worry, trust me, the heart of a father. And saying, I'm going to send another, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan, I'm going to send another a helper want to be with you and to encourage you and to strengthen you. And then in the heart of a father, not the father, but the heart of a father, the heart of the Abba, the son then stops, lifts up his eyes and prays, Father, glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. You've given him authority to give eternal life to all whom you've given him. This is eternal life. They may know you, the only true God. Glorify me with the glory that I have with you before all of existence. And then he prays, Father, protect them. Watch over them. Guard them. They're my sheep. They're my children. Guard them that no one, one of them may be lost. And Father, my desire is not that they just experience joy in life, but they would experience my joy. A satisfied relationship that I have with you, Father, that I've had for all of eternity, completely joyful and happy and satisfied. I want them to have that, Father. I've given them your word, he says in verse 14. They're not of this world. Father, I send them as you sent me, and I'm praying for them, and I'm praying for all who are going to hear about my love. And then towards the end of John 17, Jesus stops and says, I can't wait for them, Father, to be in heaven to see my glory. I've given them my glory, but I can't wait for them to come to heaven and to see it firsthand. And Father, the love that you loved me with, I give to them so that we who are believers and in Christ, the very love that the Father loves the Son is the type of love and the very love that he loves us who are in the Son. This doesn't sound like the God of Stephen Colbert. Engaged, caring, affectionate, a shepherd. When we think of our God, the God of the Bible, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and triune perfection, all in patient harmony, working to gather his people, to grow his people, to protect his people, to guard his people, so that we might experience joy, 
We've been studying a framework for Christian joy through John 17. Those affections that Jesus gives that make up the framing, the internal framing of the ship of our life. To give strength to the hull of our life so that we might truly experience an unshakable joy. A joy not rooted in circumstances, but a joy rooted in who God is. And joy is just that, right? The result of properly placed affections. Joy is the result of affections placed in the right place, like framing and timber in the interior structure of a hull of a ship. If our joy is rooted in who Christ is, we need not fear and wonder if this God cares, but a God who, in his love, yeah, we make mistakes. And we are sinners, right? We don't, we don't measure up to his righteousness. Am I correct in that? We continue to struggle with our sin. But we have not a God who is sitting up there tallying every single thing in this mild displeasure. Yes, sin grieves his soul. Don't misunderstand that. But it is the heart of an Abba who said in Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If God be for you, who can be against you? Nothing can separate you from my love. I will be with you forever and ever. And here I send my son as a sacrifice for you and hear him pray with affection. I am going to bring them to heaven. They are going to be mine forever and they will experience my joy with ceaseless pleasure. Listen to that God. That's the God of the Bible. If you are in Christ, you have an advocate. If you stand redeemed, then you have someone who stands on your behalf. Let's understand John 17. I don't want us to get caught in so many of the details that we forget the overall structure. Uh, as we think about building a framework for Christian joy, we're building a series of affections that Christ lays out in John 17 the tie back to verse 13, these things have I spoken in the world that they may have my joy. What are the things that he has spoken? First, a knowledge of God, a knowledge of who Christ is, that our joy should be anchored in Christ, anchored in a pure gospel. Our salvation is not ambiguous. This is salvation. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The knowledge of a Trinitarian God. If you want to know God deeply, you must know him in his triunity. Likewise, to see a God who intercedes for us, who is sovereign and has the heart of a loving shepherd. This knowledge of who God is drives us to joy. It drives us to joy. And as an outflow of joy, drives us to mission, obedience, we're going to look at the next four affections through the end of the Gospel of John, and it is this. That as joy flows out of a knowledge of who God is, it leads to and grows in the holiness of the Spirit. It goes in the name of the Son. It glories in the radiance of the Son. And it gifts in the love of the Father. The missional life grows constantly in holiness, in the power of the Spirit. It goes in the name of the Son because he is the one who has redeemed and he has given the power. Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore what? Go, make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But the missional Christian also glories in what it has been given. Jesus said he has given the church his glory. He's given us eternal life. He's given us identity and position in him. And so the missional believer glories not in our own talent, not in our own ability, but glories that Jesus would love someone like me. And then the missional Christian gifts, gifts what it has been given, continues to flow out what has been poured in. This is where we're going. But today we look at our seventh affection and we see that joy grows in the holiness of the Spirit. Joy grows under the sunlight of the Holy Spirit as he shines into our life truth and his word so that we might be holy. Look at verse 14. We're going to read verse 14 down to verse 17. It's going to be our text for this morning. Jesus, continuing his prayer, says this, speaking to his Father. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them 
because they're not of this world just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As we look at these verses, notice first that these are bracketed by statements about the word. I've given them your word, Jesus says. The task that you gave me to communicate revelation about who you are, Father, I've given it to them. Jesus is the manifest expression and word of God to us. All of creation testifies to that there's a God. The wonder and the beauty and the complexity of creation says there is a God. But it is Jesus Christ that informs us what that God is like. It's the one who, he is the one who reconciles us and makes us one in him to fellowship with God. The Spirit is gifted to continue to make us holy in the likeness of the Son who has redeemed us. Now, we're going to unpack this a little bit further. He says, I've given them your word, and as a result, the world's hated them. The world hates them because they're not of this world, just as I am not of this world. If the world hates the master of the house, how much will he hate the servants? If you call the master of the house Beelzebub, what are they going to call us? So many times it's so easy in our flesh to want to be well thought of by the world, but here is the simple truth, and I say it again. The world is going to hate the holiness of God so that they call that which is good evil and evil good. Jesus reiterates twice here, they're not of the world, but here's my prayer, protection. And then he comes back and reminds them us again, you're not of this world. Christians, we need to be reminded again and again, if you are in Christ, you're not of this world. Therefore, stop planting your affections in this world. Because if we continue to plant our affections and our desires in this world, we're planting ourselves in a place that we don't belong. Jesus says they're not of, you're not of this, we are not of this world. His prayer is not to remove us from the world, but to keep us from the evil one, from Satan. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Set them apart, Father. Make them holy. Living sacrifices, as Paul said in Romans 12, to continually be set apart and distinct. Isn't it human nature? We want to blend into a crowd. We don't want to stand out. Now, let me put this parenthesis. Please, Christian, stand out for the right reasons. Stand out for holy reasons. Stand out for Christ centric reasons. Stand out for loving reasons. Don't stand out because you're Westboro Baptist Church picketing every veteran. Don't stand out because we're the most caustic people on the block or because we have the biggest show. Let us stand out because we are a holy people, royal priesthood who loves Jesus. You're not of this world. Set them apart. Let them be holy sacrifices, distinct. Even the word church means ecclesia, the called out ones from the world. We are called to be distinct. Jesus prays for us. The focus is on the outward missional life. The first 12 verses, it's centered on God and what he is doing and how he's protecting and watching over his people. And then beginning in verse 14, the focus turns outward He's concerned with how we are in this world. He prays for protection, that we'd be set apart, that we'd be set apart in the truth. Now here we have, perhaps, there's hints of it everywhere in John 17, but perhaps this is the most explicit reference directly about the Holy Spirit. In the preceding sections of John 14 through 16, Jesus is talking extensively about the Holy Spirit. And he calls the Spirit, the Spirit of truth. He's a helper, one who will reveal and unveil and unpack and refine and sanctify. John 15, verse 26, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, he will bear witness, who proceeds from the Father, and he will bear witness about me. Jesus is sending his helper because we're not of this world. 
He sends to us from the Father the Spirit of truth. This one who sanctifies and instructs and teaches. It's interesting, it says that he proceeds from the Father. It's in the present tense. Meaning the Spirit is eternally proceeding from the Father. It's like there's this unbroken fellowship and channel of relationship and identity that is constantly streaming from the Father to the Spirit. There's this unbroken harmony and delight and love and joy. As the Spirit unpacks and unveils and refines and helps us, it's in this unbroken flowing chain of identity with the Father. The Spirit works, and here's his primary job, by the way. Here's the primary job of the Holy Spirit. To bear witness about me. Here's one of the biggest frustrations that I have with the charismata movement of today. The tongues movement that's all about the ambiguous power of the Holy Spirit. There's a number of frustrations that I have scripturally with it. But here's, here's something that's important. Just very simply. Is that the Holy Spirit of all members of the Trinity is the one that wants to stand in the background and not be noticed. Even in John 17, this direct reference is is a reference to his function, but not even to his direct name, because the Holy Spirit wants to be in the background. He wants to point people to Jesus. That's his function. He wants to refine us and make us holy so we look like Jesus, so we bring glory to Jesus, so he can bring glory to the Father. If you're working in the church and you're behind the scenes and nobody ever sees, you know that your servant background service is actually reflective of the member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit himself. My frustration is when that the Holy Spirit is made the centerpiece of this movement, the power of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and all of this, and please don't misunderstand me, he is God, one co-equal with God. But if you want to know what a gospel movement truly looks like, If you want to know that it's a gospel movement, at the center of it will be Christ, the cross, the blood, and the Spirit doing everything he can to point people to Jesus. He's a background personality to refine and to make us fall even deeper in love with this beautiful Savior. Joy grows in the holiness of Through the word, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. But that is affected by the spirit who enlivens and implants the word. The word of God is called living. It's the living word of God. Why is this Bible living? This word is living because the spirit of God, God himself infuses it, brings it alive, and then implants it in our hearts. The reason these are not just empty words is because the God of heaven makes it alive to change lives. That's what he does. Jesus says in John 14 through 16 that he will teach us, that he will illuminate us, Paul says later in 1 Corinthians, to help us understand. That he will bring to remembrance those things that God has taught. Now let's look at three key areas this morning briefly. Number one, According to this passage, and understanding the Spirit, and how we can cultivate joy, holiness matters. Why is he called the the what spirit? The Holy Spirit. Because he himself is holy. If we want to understand joy, we must be holy. The quickest thing that will rob us of our joy is a lack of holiness. Sanctify them in the truth to be contained, surrounded, and enraptured by the truth. Set them apart. Let the Holy Spirit sanctify us through his word to make us holy. In John 16, it says the Spirit will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. It's one of his functions. To point people to Christ and to point people to Christ by making Christians holy. One of the greatest testimonies of your life is a holy life. A distinct life set apart. One of my heroes of the faith, Robert Murray McShane, lived from 1813 to 1843. This is a picture of his church in Dundee, Scotland. I was researching this. It's very interesting. Uh, This church had gone defunct, like many churches in England. 
a body of believers, of Bible-believing evangelical believers, found that this church was up for sale that was about to be bulldozed uh, and to make way for an apartment complex. Sounds like Lynchburg, right? Townhomes everywhere right now. This body of believers prayed and prayed, help us preserve this church. This body of believers were able to raise the money by the church, and today in this church is one of the fastest growing churches in Dundee, Scotland. When you look at this man, Robert Murray McShane, the one who was called to be the pastor of this church, he died at age 30. He was a young man. He became the pastor of this church at the age of 23, went to university at the age of 15, one of those brilliant minds. He was called to this church to preach the word of God, and within a few years, his reputation had spread as one of the most godly and holy preachers Scotland had ever seen. A stranger came into his church, and he said this, I heard you preach last Sabbath evening, and it pleased God to bless that sermon to my soul. It was not so much what you said, however, as your manner of speaking that struck me, that there was something powerful going on here, because I saw in you a beauty in holiness that I had never seen before in another preacher. People came to hear this young man. He was a little bit of a prodigy during his time. And as he was away on a travel, another man came and went to the groundsman who takes care of the grounds of the church and said, what's his secret? What do you see that no one else sees? How is he such a powerful pulpiteer? The groundsman took him into McShane's office and said, sit down. So the man sat down. He said, lift your hands up like this with your elbows on your desk. So the man did that as well. And then the groundsman said, now begin to weep over your lack of holiness. And begin to weep in prayer for the holiness of your church. The groundsman said that every morning, Robert Murray McShane would come into that little church, put his hands on that desk, and weep over his holiness, that God would make him holier, a more useful servant, and then he prayed and wept for his people of his church, saying, make my church holy, so they might represent Jesus. Writing to a friend, who had gone away to get his PhD and was in the midst of studying German, he wrote to his friend and said this, Robert Murray McShane did, I know you will apply hard to German, but do not forget the culture of the inner man. I mean of the heart. How diligently the cavalry officer keeps his saber clean and sharp. Every stain he rubs off with the greatest care. Remember, my friend, that you are God's sword, his instrument, I trust that you are a chosen vessel to bear his name and in great measure according to the purity and the perfection of the instrument will be the success. It is not great talents that God blesses so much as likeness to Jesus. A holy minister is an awesome weapon in the hand of God. He bled a passion of holiness. He even said this about Jesus. He said, I am convinced that God's happiness and Jesus' happiness is inseparably linked with his holiness. So likewise, may our happiness be in his holiness and in growing holiness in likeness to Christ. Here's the point. Robert Murray McShane saw this accurately because the scripture teaches this. If we want joy, be holy. A people set apart for God. If we find our joy being robbed, maybe it's because we've let the world in instead of being sanctified by the word because the word is truth and through the power of the spirit who he himself is holy will make us holy. The Holy Spirit is passionate about holiness. Did you know that's why he struck Ananias and Sapphira dead? The book of Acts, they came and they lied. They said, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. They were struck dead. Now praise God, the Holy Spirit doesn't go around striking us dead for our lack of holiness. This was an egregious breach by them to such a degree that death was the consequence. But that's how serious holiness is. Now let's be clear. When we talk about holiness, 
to be holy, to be Christians, to be missional Christians, set apart and holy. If you are in Christ, then he has made you positionally holy. What that means is that if you've trusted in Christ as your savior, then on the cross, he paid your sin. He wiped your debt away. He justified you. He regenerated you, made you a new creation, and you stand before God perfectly holy. There's nothing to add to that. Did you know that when Jesus said, it is finished, he meant, it is finished? We don't add to that. It's something that he has accomplished. So when we're talking about being a holy vessel set apart and being sanctified, he's talking about practical holiness. Practical holiness that functions not to add to our salvation, but adds to the degree to which we're able to glorify God. The more holy we are, the more glory we're able to bring to God and the greater our joy will be. Now notice this, this is, this is beautiful. The Trinitarian relationship, right? The Holy Spirit, his job is to make Jesus known. He wants to bring glory to the Son. So he wants to take what the Son has done, not with regards to salvation, but now take us, who still battle with sin and the affections of this world, and then transform us and conform us and patiently refine us and love us to be holy so that he can present us as holy instruments to the Son to bring glory to the Son so the Son brings glory to the Father. This beautiful interchange of the Trinity working together to esteem and to love and to glorify one another is beautiful. He does this perfecting, though, through his word. Through his word. The Holy Spirit works through the word. Jesus says, I've given them your word. I, Christ, have given them, O oh Father, your word. Sanctify them in your truth. A reference to the Holy Spirit. Your word is truth. The very word of God is so bound up in who the Holy Spirit is, they're almost one and the same. The authority of scripture is not just simply built on historical evidentialism, but rather the entire work of the Trinity, the Son, who is the manifest word of God, the Father, who is the source of the word of God, speaks the word of God, and the Spirit, who makes the word of God alive in our lives. John 14, 26, the help of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he's gonna teach you. He's gonna bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. Ephesians 1 says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Having your eyes and hearts enlightened. It is the spirit that gives illumination. Listen, the spirit speaks through his word. Are you in the word? The spirit doesn't speak through these tingles up the back of your spine. The spirit speaks through his word to give wisdom, to give direction, to empower us. Listen, expositional preaching, the belief that preaching and the teaching of the word of God should always be centered in the text of God. Always, no matter the venue, is the belief that the word of God, the spirit of God, speaks through it. It doesn't mean that we don't take principles and apply them in various areas of disciplines or life, but it is the conviction and the belief, not a philosophy of preaching or teaching, but a belief that this is the living word of God empowered and infused by the Holy Spirit of God who is working to destroy strongholds and every thought that raises itself up against the knowledge of God so that we might be glorified in the likeness of the Son. This word is powerful. It's powerful because of the God who enlivens it. It's powerful because of who wrote it. It's powerful because of who implants it. So how much time do we spend in the word? And this is, this is a very practical question. I mean, if you go somewhere else geographically, if God leads you somewhere else away from a church, find a church that loves the word of God not just in speech, but in practice. The word of God speaks. David, no, Donald Whitney said this, therefore I submit that the single most valuable item on earth is the Bible. Jeremiah 
Chapter 15, verse 16 said this, your words were found, I ate them. Your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Being sanctified and made holy in the truth, your word is truth. Jesus says, I've given them your word because they're in this world, this world's gonna hate them. I've given them this word so they may have hope. And it breeds joy. The knowledge of who God is, the knowledge of his word. Psalm 119, verse 46, the psalmist writes, I will speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame. I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. I will lift up my hands toward your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. Now let's practically ask the question, how do we fan to flame a love for God's word? Anybody here like sitting around a fire? Yeah? Especially this cold week, uh, I love building fires. Uh, I, I love sitting around the fire. It's therapeutic, right? You can feel the stress melt off as you sit around that warmth and watch the embers and the, the flames lick up the wood. If we want a fire for the word of God, let me give you four simple principles. Last night, I built a fire. We sat around it as a family with my parents, uh, my kids, my grandma, who's also visiting here. My kids call her Gigi, affectionately. But we sat around the fire. And four principles here. If you want to have a love for the word of God, first you need to set the wood in the right place, light the match, delight in the warmth, and then invite others to join in it with you. What does this mean? Well, let's start with the beginning. Set the wood in place. So many Christians sit around the fire pit of their spiritual lives waiting for the clouds to part and for a sudden conflagration to begin. But if I want to build that fire, guess what? I need to find wood. Not just wood, but dry wood. So if you're going to fan the flames a love for God's word, you need to build the fire by starting with the right wood, which is you got to make time for it. You just got to simply make time for it. You also need to choose choice time. The wood, fire needs wood. It needs dry wood. You're going to use the choice wood to fan and to flame that fire. Why do our devotions oftentimes get the back seat to our day instead of the primal spot of our day, the primary focus? Build the fire. Set the wood in place. Choose dry, seasoned wood. That sweet time of the day where you can spend that time with your Lord, even if it's only five minutes. Number two, light the match. Oh, I know this seems elementary, right? Light the match. You gotta hold the match to that little bit of kindling and that wood to set it aflame. And if you're gonna open God's word, you can, you can make time, but here's how many of us do it in the Christian life. All right, I've got 15 minutes to do my devos. I open my Bible. Mark a couple of lines because if I use highlighter, I'm really holy, so I'm highlighting, drawing some arrows here, making some notes, duh, done. I'm late for work, let's go. And it's done. What you're doing is you're sitting around the wood and you're staring at the wood, but you're not lighting anything. You want to light something, then you need to, you need to call out to the Holy Spirit whose word this is, like David did and said, God, show me wondrous things out of your law. Father, I only have five minutes. You know my schedule, but Father, this is your word. Show me something. Breathe your life and plant your word. You're calling out to God that this not just be words, that it not just be a book, but you're communing with the Spirit, saying, Spirit, teach me. Spirit, show me. Show me, Jesus. See, that's lighting the flame. Sometimes, however, lighting the match takes time. It took me 30 stinking minutes to light that fire last night. Yeah, they were stinking minutes at the time. I kept holding it under there, and it would go for a little bit and then die. Go for a little bit and then die. And then it tempted me and it got up a little bit further and then it died. I was about ready to go get the gasoline. <laughs> Except that's illegal, so don't do that. How many times in the Christian life, day after day, we're lighting that flame, God, God, speak, show me, I'm hurting. Show me your truth, show me Jesus. And day after day, it's like walking through a desert. We're holding the flame and nothing's catching. 
It seems like life, there is nothing happening, and it just seems like a dull walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But here's the thing. Did you know that every single time that I lit that little fire, it dried out the wood a little bit more? It dried out the wood a little bit more. And then at some point, it just took off. (laughs) If we don't set the fire and we're not disciplined and going and saying, God, show me, I'm not letting go of the horns of the altar, as it were, until you bless me. And then one day, God opens up the heavens and blesses and pours down his spirit so that we might see. And wow, that is beautiful. I've never seen that before. But you know what? That would not have happened had you not been out there daily, day after day, continuing to light the fire. Here's the third thing. After the fire is lit, sit in the light and it's warmth. Sometimes we're too quick again. Whoa, God lit the fire and showed me something neat. Time to move on. Wow. Oh God, today, help me to bask in the warmth of your might your mercy, your love. As I walk through the house, as I drive to work, help me to bask in the delight, in the warmth. And then as I go along, to invite other people to sit around the fire with me. Did you know that God, did you know who he is? Have you seen his love? And there's nothing like a passion for God's word and who he is that draws and attracts people. Invite them to sit around the fire and let them experience what you have been given. Set the wooden place, light the match, be persistent, be faithful. Delight in the warmth of the blaze and sit there and drink it in. Five minutes, five hours, whatever it may be. Invite others to join in the fire with you. What a joy it is in unity when we can enjoy the warmth of God's blaze together. Robert Murray McShane, that pastor up there in Scotland, It is said of him that it was his happy custom to spend time before breakfast reading the scriptures, three chapters a day, nothing just amazing, just three chapters a day. But he would always sing hymns as he read, pausing frequently to pray. He followed the counsel of godly 17th century Anglican Jeremy Taylor who wrote this. If you mean to enlarge your religion, your faith and understanding of who God is, Do it rather by enlarging the ordinary devotions of everyday life rather than looking for the extraordinary. And yet how many Christians, how many of us, were far too concerned with scurrying around looking for special meetings, special conferences, super teachers, super preachers, super experiences, waiting for that thing to ignite on its own instead of patiently laying out the wood, lighting the fire, watching that blaze come in God's perfect timing and enjoying the satisfaction of the journey instead of just looking for microwavable Christianity. The Spirit speaks through his word. He uses his word. I have given them your word, Jesus says. They're in the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Make them holy in your truth. May the Spirit move them, empower them because we do need help in this world. That's what Jesus is saying. The world has hated them. They're not of this world. I am not of this world. We need help in this world. John 15, verse 18, Jesus actually says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me first. I chose you out of this world. Therefore, the world hates you. But here's my prayer. I don't pray for your removal. I pray for your protection. Pray that God would sustain you and make you and encourage you. Remember Peter? Jesus told Peter, Satan's desired to have you. He's targeted you. Satan looks to to target us. He and his demonic hordes monitor and watch. They're not omniscient, but they're intelligent. And they they walk around like a roaring lion, Satan and his hordes, looking to destroy, looking to devour. So Paul says, put on your armor, be prepared for the battle because the world's gonna hate you. And Jesus, the son of God, and knowing our frailty, says, Father, don't take them out. Don't take them out, but protect them. Now, in jest, 
but not always in jest. I take issue with this because there are many times I wish God would just take me out. Ever been there? The battles have been too hard. The moment is too intense and the battles ahead are overwhelming. God, would you just come back now? Have anybody ever prayed that prayer? God, just come back now. Oh, my, the pain is too much. The discouragement's too intense. Life is so overwhelming. Just come back and spare me. But Jesus, in loving patience, says, I'm praying, Father, don't take them yet, but keep them so that they may experience my grace, my goodness, even as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Jesus reiterates again, they're not of this world, just as I'm not of this world. The missional Christian life is growing in holiness in the power of the Spirit through the word of God, recognizing that we are not of this world, that we need his help. You ever wondered why Israel was not placed on the island of Madagascar instead of the conjunction of three continents? God sovereignly opens up the world and he says, this promised land I've prepared for you, this is an ancient picture that shows from the ancient mindset, Jerusalem at the center, the northeast, Europe, to northwest, to the northeast, Asia, to the south, Africa, God put them at the highway of the ancient world. And yet so many of us as Christians, what we do is we back away and we isolate ourselves. God doesn't want us to isolate ourselves. He wants us to engage to engage in the knowledge of a God who's interceding on our behalf, who's working and empowering us. Listen, do not isolate yourself from the world. Don't compromise with the world, but engage the world. Show them what you have. Show them who lives inside. Some of us were like, oh, I can't say I don't have enough training. I don't have enough experience. I'm not that eloquent. You, you just made it all about you. If you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit of God lives within you. So then the prayer becomes, oh God, I'm going to step out in faith. Would you unleash your spirit so that they see, wow, he's been, she's been with Jesus. Let the word of God flow. Let the word of God sanctify us. Let him make us new. Let us be holy. Let us be in the world, not of the world. Let us not be isolated from the world, but may we engage the world. Joy grows in the holiness of the spirit. We're to be spirit-empowered believers. Where are you? Are you sitting by the fire pit of life hoping for a spontaneous combustion? Are you patiently building the flame, praying for the Holy Spirit of God to rain down his blessing? If you would stand with me this morning, with every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus as your Savior, there is one who's made satisfaction on your behalf, paid your debt so that you might have fellowship with God. Please come talk with me after the service. Say, Pastor, I want to know how I can have eternal life. For all of us who are in Christ, are we pursuing holiness? Are we letting the Spirit of God refine and transform us through His Word? Are we building the fire? Are we isolating ourselves from the world? Are we engaging the world? Oh, Father, we cry out to you. You have given us so much through your Son. Jesus, you have so loved us that you would die to give us your holiness and righteousness and spirit. You have been so patient with us. Even through our frailties and imperfections, yet you help us and you guide us and you refine us. Oh God, would you continue your work? Help us to be holy. Help us to live that mission, to be missional believers who are growing daily, every moment in the power of your spirit. May we let your spirit out so that people see that we have been with Jesus. 
May you be exalted today in and through us, through holy lives, called out once. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless. See you this evening. Men's Checkpoint, Ladies Common Ground.